We have begun a journey through the Gospel of John, arguably the most significant document ever to be written on earth. And we zeroed in on this point, that your life is always headed in the right direction if you're following the right person. And part of the reason we landed on that is because of this. The Gospel of John, written by John, the son of Zebedee, and also called the beloved disciple, a trusted intimate of Jesus who walked and talked with him, so reliable and attentive that Jesus entrusted his own mother to his care while bleeding and dying on the cross, and also a book written with accuracy and fidelity with the help of God himself, as we discussed from chapter 14, uses the strongest possible terms to communicate the capital importance of Jesus. He is God come to us in human form. Therefore, it makes sense that trusting him and following him is by definition the very best possible use of our time, energy, priorities, and life. Imagine being in a foreign country and you need a guide and, and you rely on that guide. Which road is safe? Which pathway is dangerous? Who to talk to? Who not to talk to? This is especially important because, you know, so many, many of your surroundings, so much of your surroundings seems, you know, uh, strange to you and unfamiliar. Well, the right guide will get you to where you need to be, but a bad guide could be disastrous. Therefore, your life, speaking about our lives now, your life is always headed in the right direction if you're following the right person, and that person is Jesus Christ. And so today we're going to go deeper with this very idea. We're going to look at what it means and why it matters that you are adopted as an actual child of God. The assurance and confidence that gives you as you journey through life, and how you might be more well-rounded in becoming more like Jesus. And so to help us do this, we're going to continue with John chapter 1, beginning at verse 6, running to the end of what is called the prologue at the end of verse 18. Get your Bibles. Maybe you've got the sermon notes on, on your app or you've downloaded it from the website. Uh, but follow along. I encourage you to take notes. Uh, last week when we began the series, I put together about a five-minute video introduction, high level of the gospel that gives you the who, what, why. I'm not going to play it again here, but if you want to review it, or maybe you missed it and you want to catch it, uh, what I'm going to do is I'll put it at the end of today's service, and so you can uh, see that so we can all get up to speed together. All right, let's dump, jump into the text. We're going to pick it up at John 1, beginning at verse uh, 6, and I'm reading from the New International Version translation. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe he himself was not the light, he came only as a witness to the light. Okay, let's pause on there for a second. So a couple of things are happening. In the first five verses from last week, we heard a lot about the Word, the Word of God. And we know, because we tracked forward to verse 14, that that Word is Jesus. He is the message, mind, and mission of God. And so here in verse 6, it shifts to John, who we will learn is John the Baptist. Now, what, what about John? Well, John came as a test to testify to the light. Now, what is the light? Well, that's the life that is in Jesus, and in fact, in all humankind, and we learn in those first five verses. In Greek, the word for witness uh, sounds a lot like martyr, which reminds us a little bit, but quite often there is a cost of, of speaking uh, the truth, and that is certainly the case here. But here we just have to see that you know Jesus is coming with arms wide open, follow the light, trust him, and experience true and eternal life. John Calvin, the Reformed theologian, says this, Christ is light reflecting from himself and through himself and thence shining brightly upon the whole world. There is no other source or cause of its brightness anywhere. I think that's really, really good. Now, John is a witness to the light, which is the life that is within Jesus, uh, the light of Christ. Now, think of an announcer at like a talent show or a coffee house or something. The announcer's job isn't to talk about himself all night. No, his job is to direct people's attention to the ones who are going down on center stage, right? And so it is with John and us when it comes to Jesus. The point is to point to him. The point is to point to him. Continuing at verse 9, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. Pause. Okay, so Jesus, as the light, comes into the world. Now what's going on here? 
uh, the world is quite often spoken of as the people of the world generally, right? Because the world earth is inanimate. It can't think or feel. But when John's gospel, when the world is referenced, it quite often means the people of the world. For example, John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world, meaning the people of the world, that he gave his one and only son. There are other times when the world in John's gospel refers to kind of the sinful uh, or ungodly elements within society. It really kind of just depends on the context. So here, Christ the one who, who, who is not only Savior, but Creator, comes into the world He has made. Uh, he sustains all things by His powerful Word, right, that we learned in Hebrews 1. But here, uh, s some people in the world clearly do not receive Him, and there's a certain irony in that. But, uh, verse 11, very, very good news, in fact, the good news. Yet to all who did receive Him, to those who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. Now, friends, this is all about adoption. We have a new special status because we have been adopted in Christ, brought into the household of God, a status that we don't have before. We just simply don't have it outside of Christ. Christ opens the door to the household of God, and we respond, and we come in by faith. How do we do that? We receive him. We believe in him. That's how we gain entrance to the household of God. Christ opens the door. In fact, he is the door, and we come in by faith. But what does belief mean? Well, uh, it doesn't simply mean like I believe that he happened to exist a long time ago as a historical person or that he was a nice person. No, it is genuine personal trust that Jesus is who he says he is, that he is in fact, and um, that we learn about in John's gospel, the whole point is to convince us that Jesus is the son of God and Messiah. So it's personal and genuine trust that Jesus is who he says he is. Now think of this whole idea of adoption, this new special status that we don't have outside of Jesus, okay? Think, think of a parent. This is wonderfully assuring to us and tells us something about God's heart. So uh, think of a parent. Does, does, does a wonderful, perfect parent just kick a child outside of the house the first time they make a mistake? No, of course not. D does the level of love that, that, a, that this perfect parent have for a child fluctuate day to day based on how good they do at something, how bad they do at something? No, no, no. It is, it is so consistent. Why? Because they have chosen, they have taken this initiative to love and to choose this child and to welcome them into their house. It is so, so amazing. And that's so incredible. God Almighty, the, one who, the God who was and is and is to come, a holy, 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 uh, the majestic God comes down to our level, comes comes to the world of this great act of love. It's just so, so wonderful and incredible that we get to, to experience this blessing. God coming to us in Jesus is the greatest expression of love in the history of planet Earth, okay? But God chooses us. The initiative is with him. Um, Max Locato, the devotional writer, says uh, that there are surprise pregnancies, but there are no surprise adoptions. Surprise pregnancies, but no surprise adoptions. I get what he's saying. He's getting at the fact that this is God's initiative to us. He recalls a story one time of being in uh, Brazil, and there's a lady named Dona Nusa, and she died, and he was at her funeral, and people were packed in. And um, up beside the coffin, there's this woman named uh, Carmelita. And Carmelita had a powerful story, but while the funeral went on, she was clearly, you know, distressed, but she didn't really let too much emotion out until the funeral was over and most of the people had gone out. But she stayed behind beside the, the, the casket and she leaned over it and she was clearly so distraught and tears from her face fell on the wood of the coffin and ran down the side. And she said, Obrigada, Obrigada, which translated means thank you, thank you. And the backstory is that Carmelita had this horrific childhood and she, uh, her father was never around and her mother was uh, a prostitute. And so she was living with these impoverished relatives destined to this future of pain and, and, and these horrific circumstances. And that's when Donna Nusa came into her life and she saw the situation. She was moved with compassion and she adopted young Carmelita at the age of seven into her own household and raised her and gave her love, a home, and a name. Something that she would not otherwise have. And that starts to help us think about us being adopted through, through faith in Christ, God's initiative. He opens the door to the household of God uh, and giving us love and a home and a name. It is so, so beautiful and it is an incredible gift. Not only is an expression of the love and care that God has for us. It's something else. God does battle for his children. Think mama bear. Think papa bear when a cub is in danger. William Gurnall is a uh, Puritan pastor from the 1600s in England, and he says it like this. 
He says, he who has God's heart does not lack for his arm. Right, referring to God's power, to his strength. He's talking about how God fights for his children. Right? Quote, can you imagine the love God has for a child? He has carried so long in the womb of his eternal purpose. When God defends you, he also defends himself. I love that. When God defends you, he also defends himself. Why? Because we are from his very household. Thanks be to God. How awesome is that? Continuing with the next verse. Verse 14, the word, right, meaning Jesus. The word Jesus, the mind, message, and mission of, mission, mission of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. Pause. This is what theologians call the incarnation. God coming to us in human form. In his rendering of the Bible called the message. Uh, Eugene Peterson, and we should note that, by the way, it's not a translation of the Bible, it's a, an approximate rendering. Uh, Eugene Peterson translates verse 14 like this, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood, and moved into the neighborhood. I love that. That speaks to something about what is going on here. And these are such incredible implications. The God of the universe coming to us, this great, mind-blowing, world-changing expression of his love for broken, sinful people like you and me. That's amazing. But also in verse 14, we learn more about Jesus, right? We beheld his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of what? Grace and truth. Grace and truth. These are attributes and characteristics of God himself perfectly on display in Jesus because Jesus is God come to us in human form. But let's, let's think about what those words mean because we use them a lot, but we might not reflect totally on what they mean. First, grace. We say grace. We sing about amazing grace. We did so earlier in today's service. Uh, we call people gracious, right? What does it mean? Grace really is generosity we don't deserve. It's generosity we don't deserve. So maybe a comparison would, would help, and I've used a similar comparison before. So justice is getting exactly what you deserve, tit for tat. Mercy is getting less than you deserve, right? So it's maybe it's a, it's a flimsy punishment based on a serious crime. That's someone showing you mercy. Grace is generosity you don't deserve. And some theologians called it unmerited favor. So this is very good news because we are broken. We have missteps all the time, uh, but God is uh, gracious and generous toward us in Christ. And the second word is truth. Well, truth, what is it? Truth is just that it's, it's truth. It's the opposite of deception. Um, it corresponds to God's reality. Now, I just need to put a little footnote in here because we live in a time where a lot of people say truth is relative. Truth is relative. Now, think about that for a second. The statement truth is relative is itself a statement about what someone thinks is true. So if someone says truth is relative and they think that that statement is true, they're disproving their own logic by saying that. Because if truth is relative, well, then what they're saying is relative, thus proving themselves to be false, right? So truth is an objective fact. It is firmly fixed and it comes from God, the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. One of my own memory verses is Psalm 119 verse 89. Your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm or fixed in the heavens. I love that. Beautiful. Continuing verse 15, John testified concerning him, meaning Jesus. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Right? So Jesus was born after, chronologically after John, but he's greater for all the reasons we've been discussing. Verse 16, out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. Right? That's really like generosity and grace stacked upon one another time and time again. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So the law of Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, meaning seen God fully, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. And so that is just obviously another reference to the divinity of Jesus. I'm not going to fully get into that in the discussion of the Trinity here, but if you want to uh, hear a bit more about that, I do talk about it a little bit in the Pulse podcast that corresponds with this sermon. But we end the text there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Okay, well, at the outset, I said that your life is always headed in the right direction if you're following the right person. I also said that we're going to take a closer look at that further by asking what it means and why it matters that you are adopted as a child of God, as an actual child of God. Next, the assurance and confidence that that gives you as you journey through life, and then how you might be more well-rounded in becoming more like Jesus. Well, as you think through that, consider this triple A formula, adoption equals assurance plus action, okay? Adoption equals assurance plus action. All right, let me parse that out a little bit. First, adoption. My guess is that most of us actually undervalue undervalue the significance of what it means to be adopted by God. So perhaps we think that, well, all people are sort of God's children because, well, we're all made in his image and, you know, Genesis 127, and we trace back to common, you know, lineage and parents. And, and so we downplay or misunderstand what it means that we actually have a special privileged status as adopted children of God, something that outside of Christ we would otherwise not have. A homeless person in uh, Manhattan who was used to be treated very poorly. Uh, he lived close to the fish market, so that certainly didn't uh, help things very much. And so he preferred to kind of be away from people and, and spend time down by the wharf. And he slept in a dumpster, um, uh, sorry, on the wharf behind the dumpster. And he would get his food from that, um, whether it'd be, you know, things tossed out from local restaurants the night before, whether it be some fries, whether it be a pizza crust, or sometimes maybe a little wedge of, of, of cheesecake if he could stomach it. But one day he was going through the garbage and he found uh, this little piece of paper and he thought, okay, what is it? It's got a bit closer and it seemed like it was a a lottery ticket. And, and back in a previous version of his life, he would get one a week, you know, trying to win the lottery and uh, he couldn't afford that now. So he saw this and he thought, well, maybe I should pick it up. Maybe I'll, and why bother? But he decided to pick it up. And so he takes it and he goes over to a newspaper stand because this particular newspaper, it printed the winning lottery numbers right in the front. So he'd be able to see if this matched at all. And so he held up the first number. Well, it matched. The second number matched. The third number matched. Could this actually be happening? Yes, yes, yes. It turns out it was a match, and he was the next and latest winner in the New York lottery. Well, hours, just, just hours passed, and all of a sudden, cameras and newspaper reporters are around him, asking him all sorts of questions. And as he thinks back on that experience, he recalls how there was this uh, female reporter, and he recalls that her perfume smelled so good, and she asked him how he felt, and he couldn't remember the last time someone had actually asked him that question. He was to receive $243,000 every year for 20 years, which is almost $5 million. And he started to realize that he would never have to search for his dinner in a dumpster again. Now, as I was telling you that story, you probably got excited, just kind of like I did when I first ran across it. Um, just thinking about the prospect of this uh, vagrant's fortunes uh, about to change. Well, that story just starts, just starts to scratch the surface of the value of our adoption. That is the winning ticket, my friend. We are in Christ spiritual billionaires. Without him, spiritually speaking, we are sleeping behind the dumpster on the wharf. Verse 12 says, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now here's the second part of that equation. Assurance. So you can be assured and have confidence that you are right with God as one of his children in his very household. You're in. And I think we need this assurance because, you know, we have a, a bad year or we maybe we're in the habit of messing up, which is probably a pretty common occurrence for most of us. You can have this assurance not because of how great you are, uh, but because you have been adopted. You have been deliberately chosen. The text goes out of its way to say this. You have been deliberately chosen in Christ through faith. Now think of a parent... If, if a child messes up, does that mean they're immediately out of the house or, 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 or the, the level of love for a child fluctuate day by day based on how well or how poor they do at certain things? No, of course not. Because we have been adopted, we receive love, a home, and a name. Plus, God does battle for you as one of his children. Remember Gurnall's words, he who is God's heart does not lack for his arm. Wow. Okay. Friends, this is all a part of your divine DNA, adoption, it was assurance plus action. So let's get into this third part of it, the word action. So how do we live? How, how do we act as one of God's children, as members of God's household? Well, if we want to be more like Jesus, we need to know what Jesus is like. 
Verse 14 provides a succinct summary, and we'll see this play out as the gospel goes on. Here's what it says. It says that Jesus is full of grace and truth. That is who he is. He is full of grace, meaning he is generous beyond what people deserve. He is also full of truth. It follows, therefore, that if we want to be like him, we need to be deliberate about being people of grace and truth. Barry Corey is the president of Biola University, and in an interview, he talked about Christians that they should have soft edges and firm centers, right? So we can kind of think of it like a peach, right? Soft edges, firm centers. Our soft edges, are, I, I just think that's a really great way to think about it. Our soft edges, that's, that's about how we approach others with grace and generosity, Right, But that firm center is, is that pit in the middle, a strong and uncompromised faith in the Lord and in his word. Now, in my experience, people tend to favor one over the other. Some people focus a lot on truth, but are very ungracious in how they act toward uh, other people. And they, they kind of, uh, that's, that's an imbalance, right? Other people are very gracious, but they downplay or neglect God's truth, which is also an imbalance. But Jesus is both. He is full of grace and truth. So it follows that if we want to be like him, we need to be deliberate about growing in both. So as you think about that triple A equation, adoption equals assurance plus action. What is a word from God specifically to you? We believe in God, the power of God, the goodness of God, the providence of God. Uh, we also trust that the scriptures are God's inspired word to us. And so what is a word from God to you at this particular moment in your life? Is it one? Do you need the reminder that you are in fact adopted by God and that this is the most valuable gift and inheritance you will ever receive? You have a new special status that you would not otherwise have without Christ. Second, do you need assurance and this time, maybe maybe some people, there's a time of uncertainty, there's things coming up and down, going, and you need assurance that you are, in fact, loved by God and that he fights for you. Or third, do you need a corrective in how to be more like Jesus? Is there some sort of imbalance? Do you need to grow in grace or in truth or both? Which one do you favor? Which one do you tend to neglect? Where's that imbalance? Where is the potential to bless others. Adoption equals assurance plus action. This is, my friends, your divine DNA. Your life is always headed in the right direction if you're following the right person. Heavenly Father, as we reflect on uh, these closing verses in the prologue to John's Gospel, we want to give you thanks that you have adopted us and you have given us a new and special status in Christ. Help us to appreciate the value of that and see the assurance in that. Lord, help us to be more like Jesus, to trust in him, to trust in his goodness, that we are right with you based on his righteousness. And we thank you for that gift. Um, you've received us, forgiven us, uh, restored us in relationship with you in and through what he has done. Help us to, to look within ourselves. Where, where do we need to grow in either grace or truth? What have we neglected? Where is the imbalance? Help us to be more wholehearted as we seek to follow you. Lord, we ask and pray all these things in the name of our risen Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen.